Our first guest speaker is a gender and child justice activist who has worked alongside the women's movement for over a decade. He holds a Master of Science in Gender and Development Studies from the University of the West Indies and a Master of Arts in Women and Child Abuse Studies from the London Metropolitan University. Presenting on the types of gender-based violence, please welcome Marcus Kisun. Because I want people to understand that gender-based violence isn't an act itself, right? It is a concept. It is a way in which we understand the way things happen to people. And usually there are groups of people who are marginalized, who lack resources and privilege, right? And those are the ones who are usually affected by gender-based violence. Now, firstly, in order to understand gender-based violence, we need to understand gender. Quickly, who knows what gender is, right? No, right. Gender is, a, gender is a concept that helps us to understand relationships. How men experience the world. How women experience the world. How children experience the world. How migrants experience the world. How, how LGBT folks experience the world. It's, it's, a, it's a relational understanding. And we all do have the same relationship with the world. I, as a man, have particular privileges that women don't have. Right? Women, in particular situations, have more privilege than other women, and they experience the world differently. Women experience the world completely different from men. Now, I need to put this disclosure out here. I'm not speaking on behalf of women. My duty here is to bring information collected as a scientist, as a social scientist, the experiences of women, and bring this information forward. And doing my duty as a man, as a scholar, and as an activist, right? So I'm not speaking for women. I am just taking the experiences of my sisters and my mothers prior to me and bringing it here as we, as we think about solutions moving forward. So we know what gender is, right? We know people experience these things differently. So gender-based violence are the violence and the experiences that people face based on their gender, where they are positioned in the world, right? If we, just, if we were to just think about geography for a second, what part of the globe ex women experience the most violence? or most visible forms of violence and the most oppression. It's usually global south, right? If we look at places like India, Africa, the Caribbean, the experiences of women there are, are noticeably different from women in, in the global north, which is Europe, Canada, the, U, the US, etc. So automatically we start to see how there's a relationship with where you're positioned, and those spaces are usually spaces that were once imperialist, that they were once colonized, that they were once robbed identity and culture and religion, right? So we automatically start to see how people relate to the world differently, yeah? If we were to look at the way particular skin colors and hair types were, for example, used as a barrier for employment, and we still see it today when certain children of certain hair types are ridiculed and prevented from graduating from top schools in Trinidad because of something as simple as hair, something that we cannot control. So we start to see the relationship, and that is gender, right? Gender isn't just about women. It isn't just about the battle between men and women. It isn't just about the LGBT community. It's about the relationship, right? Let's start, let's, start, let's start outside and come in. Some of the forms of gender-based violence that we may be privy to or we don't. Have you ever heard about breast ironing? Some of us may, some of us may not. You're not allowed to answer any questions. Eh? <laughs> Neither you two. <laughs> or Ms. Dialson, you're not allowed to answer anything. Right? Um, breast ironing. And I, I want you to hold on to the information here that I'm giving you because you have homework to do as well, right? So, breast ironing is where when girls reach puberty and their breasts start to develop, adults in the community would hut these planks of wood and these planks of stone and rest it on the breast to prevent developing. The rationale behind it is that when 12 and 10 year olds and I, the women, girls develop breasts at all different ages, right? The minute they start to develop breasts, they put these hot planks of wood on it to prevent it because they say the breast is what causes rape. Breast is what causes rape. When we all know differently, 
bodies and clothes and body types and hair are no excuses for sexual violence. But yet in some cultures, they think that this is what they need to do to prevent it. Because of course we can't address the key issue because it's very uncomfortable, which is the perpetrators, which is the predatory culture. Right? Another one, you're all familiar with female genital mutilation? Which is the removal of the clitoris, and the clitoris is the pleasure zone of women. And in some, of, some parts of the world, they say that in order to prevent women from leaving and cheating on their husbands, they remove the clitoris as another way of policing and controlling women's bodies and sexualities. All, all excusing who? Who gets excused in these two processes that we just discussed? Perpetrators, usually men, right? It's okay to say that, right? So we've noticed that the response to gender-based violence has always been a responsibility of who? The women, right? In the Break the Silence project, right, headed by Ro uh, Professor Rhoda Reddock, who's also on the board of the CADV, we found that uh, in child sexual abuse, society felt that it was the mother's responsibility to end the abuse. It was the mother's responsibility to know who she was bringing home. We don't ever know who we have in our homes until something happens, right? That's just the culture of predator predators, right? They will never declare who they are immediately. But we live in a society that still thinks that girl children and children, whether male or female, and mothers are responsible for ending this. We have no language around holding perpetrators accountable for what they have done. So all of the work of the women's movement and highlighting stories that we're about to hear gives us an idea of the experience that they have. But it isn't the response to the problem. We have to look at the cause. We have to look at who gets excused from committing these forms of, of violence. If we were to look inward now, the Coalition Against Domestic Violence service 500 and probably plus clientele of the, you know, in the issue of domestic violence, right? The Break the Silence highlighted that there's one in every eight adults is walking around who has been affected by child sexual abuse, right? That means one in every eight has had an experience of unwanted touch, non-consenting sexual activity, unwanted pregnancy, um, unwanted penetration. There's a research done in 2003 that all children under the age Almost 42% of children under the age of 10 said that their first experience was forced. Yeah. Right? So we need to understand that this is a gendered issue, and this is why we have 16 years of activism against gender-based violence. Now, the reason why the issue is taken up by women is because women make up majority of these numbers. Right? Female genital mutilation, rape, sexual assault, majority of it are affected by women and majority of the perpetrators, the Children's Authority report almost highlights almost 90% of the perpetrators of child sexual abuse are relatives or known to the, to the child and are men. So are our responses, again, to just think about how do we just make the woman safe or how do we end the culture of women's lacking of freedom? The issue isn't safety. The issue is freedom. The issue is the inequalities that women experience because of their sex. Because they were born into a world where the, the breast, the vagina, has a particular meaning, and we have to change that meaning if that's the work that we want to do. Now, your homework now is, as you listen to all of us speak, you have to write down on those little sticky notepads what does, what does domestic violence mean? Reason why I'm asking domestic violence, now we know that domestic violence is a form of gender-based violence. There are a number of women who are not affected by domestic violence, but are affected by other things, right? But we need to sometimes focus on something, and domestic violence is a problem in Trinidad and Tobago, right? We need to understand from you, what do you understand by the term domestic violence? Reason being is when I was having this, and I'm wrapping up, when I was having this conversation with, with Miss Khan, she was, you know, she was taxing her brain. What could we do? What could we do? Because I personally felt like we were doing the same things over and over 
and we weren't seeing the results that we want, which is the end or the eradication of violence against women, right? And we were talking and we were unpacking and, and we discussed that, she, so she said, could you come and talk about the different forms of domestic violence with, with us? And I said, sure. And I said, let's even push the boundary even further. Let's talk about the ones that we don't really unpack. And we had agreed that uh, no one talks about economic abuse in the ways in which we look for in terms of sexual and physical and emotional and ver verbal abuse. Because those are things we could see. We're a very visual state, you know, as we're here in the art cafe, right? We're a very visual, we're very visualized people. And if we don't see images of trauma and abuse, then automatically it doesn't happen, right? And it becomes easier because the way the mind works is that nobody wants to face trauma, nobody wants to face pain. It's just a defense mechanism. So the less we know, the easier we could go through our life. That's why I said this conversation is going to be uncomfortable. We have to talk about the uncomfortable. So we agreed that, uh, and I advocated that could Sir Optimus International invest in some very basic research for us to understand how the women of Trinidad and Tobago experience the economic part of their domestic violence situation. What it would require is a small survey of about 20 to 50 women affected by domestic violence currently and in the past, asking them how things like finances, moving through the bank system, having access to money, having access to public transportation. And why I say public transportation? Because if I were to bring a list of what people say economic abuse is, it would be from the global north, right? But that same survey that, that, um, that Sabrina spoke about, one of the narratives was an, an Indo-Caribbean woman at the age of 53 that said her husband went to the taxi driver stand and told them, threatened them, to do not drop her to work. Yes. Isn't that a form of domestic, um, economic domestic violence? And that would never be in a checklist if I were to bring a checklist for you. Hence the reason why I'm sitting here today to advocate to you, Sir Optimus International. Please invest in some basic research, which I am willing to do pro bono, right? That we could understand economic abuse, create narratives and the understanding of what this checklist for economic abuse looks like so that people like my sister here from Gender Based Violence Unit has something that is local, that speaks to the women of our, of our communities, right? So that when they go in to do the work, they know that they have sound research to help us identify this, this non-visible form of domestic violence, which is the economic abuse. So my job here is to share with you what gender-based violence is, how women in Trinidad and Tobago experience it, and to advocate for a new response or to add to the response, which is research and understanding economic forms of, of, gender, of domestic violence. With that, we strengthen the response of the police, we strengthen the policies because there's nothing that mentions economic abuse or identifies it. We depend on social workers and teachers and, and clinicians to use their professional judgment. But we know sometimes professional judgment comes with biases. So we need a list. And the only way we could get that list is if we invest in the research and the data. So again, I say, please, Sir Optimus International, as a response moving forward, can we invest in some economic abuse data collection that we could now use in our future campaigns, our future assessments, and our future response to gender-based violence. Thank you.